thank you, Lucas, for your introduction, because I guess uh, it's uh, one kind of introduction to the necessity to uh, speak about the emergent, emergent technologies uh, like blockchain and their relation uh, between sustainable development goals and cannabis. So thank you very much, Graham, for coming, and Jerome. Uh, I guess your contribution is really important in this kind of uh, conference because a lot of people don't know how is blockchain, for example, and why it's important uh, for the sustainable development goals and actually for drug policy, not only for cannabis. Uh, so maybe uh, you can start with your experience because I, I think uh, with the, the blockchain are important for the cannabis clubs and for the industry too to, to have a real traceability of the, of the growth of the, the, from seed to the bud because, you know, f some companies uh, in Europe, uh, when they don't have their stock, they buy to the cartels in Mesoamerica. And if we have the, the chains to play in the blockchain, we can uh, have more transparency and more uh, democratic way to, to know what is real from this cannabis industry, you know. So please, Jerome. Sure, yeah. Thank you, Martin. And uh, it's always great to meet someone who's also uh, sees benefits in blockchain, you know, and it's exciting. So that's how we got uh, met each other. So just to introduce myself, um, my background is in the pharmaceutical industry. And I worked in uh, a GMP environment for 17 years doing analytical chemistry. Um, but over the, the, the recent years, my like, love for plant medicine and, and all plant medicine uh, was, became incompatible with working in the pharmaceutical industry, producing single molecule compounds that didn't resonate with me anymore. And so I left the industry in the last year, which was a big, big step, you know, because uh, it was kind of a a hard decision, there was a lot of factors at play, but... Um, <laughs> oh, thank you so much. <laughs> uh, so, um, uh, what I have been channeling my energy into since leaving um, on a full-time basis is developing a blockchain quality system that, uh, you know, fortunately now we can, we can notarize quality documents and a small player or a small producer can compete with the pharma industry in terms of quality because of these features of blockchain. So um, over, the, over the last number of years, myself and Graham have been analyzing the blockchain space. And you know, they're, they're, at the moment, there's about 2,000 different protocols all doing bunches of different tasks. So for me, it was a case of uh, analyzing the whole lot, uh, discarding what was not interesting to me and finding the ones that uh, could be useful and combining multiple protocols together to make a bigger project. So in this case, it was um, using decentralized uh, database storage combined with proof of existence and the ability to notarize any document uh, and make it a legal document. So, um, uh, you know, in, in, in this case, a GMP document is a legal document and now anyone can do that cheaply where the, the blockchain acts as their notary. So. I, to me, this is huge, and uh, you know. So it, my main focus has been on proof of existence and um, using the blockchain in clever ways. You know, not for transactions like the normal way, but using it for other things. So um, I'll pass it on to Graham. There's loads more to tell you, but um, I'll leave Graham. Jerome, that's a long time coming. That applause. It's about a year now since you left Pfizer's, the institution that captured you 17 years ago as an intellectual in, uh, in Ireland. And I suppose that's kind of where we, we, we come from. We come from a, a land of 4.4 million people where pharmaceutical medicines and technology have become our biggest industry. Um, I'd like to just thank Martin um, in particular and Fahid, uh, wherever you are, I'm sure he's running around, and Hannah for organizing uh, what has been like a very interesting couple of days. And I hope to see more events like this. So yeah, thanks for having me here. Um, 
I suppose I just wanted to start with some context, like what are the sustainable development goals and what is blockchain and why are we all here listening to each other over the last couple of days? Um, the sustainable development goals were like set up to um, enhance social inclusion, uh, protect the environment and uh, promote, um, promote economic growth. So when you think about the two billion people worldwide who do not have a bank account, who are excluded from the financial system of basic buying of services and goods at a supermarket, online, on the internet, calling each other from Skype. And that sector of the population have been resorted to 15% to 20% fees by middlemen like Western Union and other people that make it easier because supposedly they're not, they're not identified enough, they're not KYC'd enough, they're not AML'd enough. There's all these regulations that banks won't touch them, but these middlemen services will. And that's the reason why Bitcoin was invented in 2008, following the financial crash of the Lehman Brothers. It was a financial inclusion for a global currency that anybody could run from their home computer without any identity, documentation, without any bank account, without any... Uh, <laughs> intermediary at all it doesn't matter about your sex race color skin whatever you can just do this and that gives you your social inclusion and your you, we take we took it back and that's what we're doing so what is blockchain what is bitcoin well it's a public ledger of transactions these transactions can represent anything so so far bitcoin is mostly financial although people are building applications on top of it and that's where we have ethereum as one of the 2000 or so protocols um so what is it that um what is it that blockchain is, is, is important or why is it that we're applying this to sustainability? I think that's gonna be different for everyone. For Jerome, that's clearly supply chain and quality control. I think that's very important that we understand that very well and transparently from seed to sale to customer to their you know, reporting of that medicine that they're taking or that food. For me personally, um, my company is called Festi, and what Festi does is it protects your information or your data. So when you think about decentralization, moving away from the paradigm of centralization. We see this with banks going into Bitcoin, but we also see that with data centers centrally controlling your information and your data. Well, this is important for all of you, um, whether you consume cannabis or not, there are certain consumables that you have, whether it's alcohol, coffee, cheese, these can all have an impact on your life insurance when you tap that card, which is very convenient, but we've given away a part of our sovereignty and a part of our freedom with the convenience that plastic credit cards have given us. So what I find very important with the legalization movement that has recently occurred in Canada, and this will happen across the board, is that the data that's already been accumulated by those transactions that have occurred within a dispensary are being used against those very people who voted towards legalizing it. Because when they cross a border to the United States, guess who owns those, those data points, those data centers? They're in the United States. And that's, that's a warfare country that is federally, whether we've heard some wonderful stories over the last couple of days and some great companies coming out of this, and there's a great movement in America and the people there are wonderful, but the federal government is not. And that's not just one government, there's multitudes of governments where Canadians will face problems now traveling because their data will follow them. That's a data footprint. And so I'm interested in disintermediating that, taking away the, the, the intermediary there and decentralizing your data. So you have a choice. You can sell that data if you want back to the marketing companies and advertising companies in a transparent manner. Absolutely, you have freedom to do so. You are the product at the end of the day. Nothing is free. You are the product and you're being advertised and marketed towards. But if you want to encrypt certain in information or transactions, like the alcohol you consume, the cheese you consume, or, 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 or whether it's the cannabis cheese you consume, then you should have the freedom to do so. Yeah. So, uh, I guess in this way, it's important, for example, in uh, regulation models like in Uruguay, uh, places in this in this place you can if you can access have access to the cannabis you need to register in the government. So uh, a few a few years ago we do uh, we we make a research in Uruguay about the the advance of the regulation in the two first years, and actually a lot of users don't want to be in the list of the governments because you don't know if the next government persecute you. So I guess in these cases, or in this, guy, in this case, uh, like these models, uh, the blockchain 
it's uh, helped to because uh, you can have a smart contract with multiple keys and one key for the government, one key for the user, and if you don't are agreed to give your data, they can access, maybe some yeah. of you can. At the point of transaction, that is when you encrypt that transaction, and you can upload or you can hash that onto a chain to prove that that transaction occurred, but that transaction can be held by yourself, so you don't have to choose to sell that to a government. I, I'm actually not really afraid of governments. I don't think they're really the problem, if I'm honest. They'll be obsolete in their own way. I think they're going to transform in many different ways and they're going to catch up. But it's really the corporates, and that's kind of like my first point was, you know, around the North America in particular, but how the rest of the world will, will look to regulate this. Um, it's really, for me, it's the, it's the multinational corporates. But, uh, yeah, certainly that's, that's an interesting one with, with Uruguay, for sure. Well, sort of back to back towards the the plant itself and uh, medical cannabis and how can blockchain be applied to that so um you know uh, the the plant has competitors from the traditional pharmaceutical industry so um as we saw with the tilray presentation today those categories are pain and anxiety and sleep disorders and all of those so the compounds that are used the single molecule entities that are um uh, being used in this case uh, the antipsychotics, the opioids, and all of these have side effects. They have adverse events, and um, you know, Philippe uh, mentioned these in detail earlier. Um, so, uh, to tie that in with blockchain, you can uh, create a legal document and a statement of truth of your adverse event, um, which is totally novel, um, and uh, to actually. Um, as people who want to access medical cannabis because they have had side effects, they should notarize these side effects, keep it for themselves, but create a legal document um, as, as a backup of their experience. Um, we know that the, the Uppsala Monitoring Center, which is responsible for adverse event gathering and collating, they state themselves that only about two or 3% of adverse events are reported and gathered, which is completely unacceptable uh, to me from my point of view. So um, there's a huge opportunity to use blockchain. It's not that hard to create um, a legal document surrounding your claim. And I think that it will be extremely powerful tool uh, for any plant medicine, um, people who, who support plant medicine or, or who have moved from a single molecule entity to uh, the entourage effect um, of multiple molecules that are not paintable. So um, it's, it's like a, a really powerful tool and it's simple and we have set this up and I have done my own um, version of a trial adverse event report, um, which is done in the form of a statement of truth, which is a legal document. And I, I believe um, that we could work with, uh, you know, people with a legal background to fine tune it and to make it really, um, you know, rock solid. Um, and. The more people that do this, the better, because 1% is, is not big enough figure to actually gather the true picture of, um, you know, the opioid crisis and, and all of that. So um, that to me is one of the biggest opportunities, I think, from blockchain. Um, so, yeah. Just to reiterate on that point, so, you know, you can consider Bitcoin as like being your own bank, but you can consider a protocol like what Jerome just described as being your own medical data or your own medical records. And when you have a system in place like that where, let's say, uh, this is adopted and people start uploading their medical information on their own private node or their own private server or something like that, and this is immutable, so this is a piece of record or um, event that occurred in life that is recorded and it can't be changed, that is far more superior than the current way we collect data from clinical trials, which is apparently the standard. It's actually not very hard to replace that standard because, again, it's centralized. Central companies who have one motive, that's to profit from patients, can decide what the hypothesis is, what the control is, who the subjects are, who should be removed from the subjects. It's like a jury. It's like walking in and it's like, it's like an episode of Suits. Like you can select your jury, you can select your patients. That is the weakest argument ever given to su supporting a medicine or not supporting a medicine. So this, this is an amazing piece of research that I, I recommend anybody to look into. It's called Verify, by the way. I guess no... Thank you, Graham. I guess uh, 
it's not only for the medical uses, you know, because I guess it's important for a decentralization of the monopolies of the big industry. Uh, I guess the blockchain and the cryptocurrencies can help to the social cannabis clubs uh, because they, or for example, in Uruguay too, uh, a few months ago, uh, the banks, so the US banks, uh, say to the Uruguayan banks, if you open an account of uh, some company related with cannabis, you can do business in the United States. So uh, with the blockchain, with the cryptocurrencies, uh, we can support the local uh, companies, the circular economy. So maybe you, Graham, can talk about it. Sure. Um that's a very good point, is that basically we're creating our own economy, we're creating our own job marketplace. And, um, you know, within that marketplace, I suppose anybody can be their own company as well. And that's something that's very interesting, because now that we started with our own currency, we now need to use that medium to trade for goods and services so we can build companies on top of it. In 2014, I built a small a semi-successful e-commerce website. We generated some revenue. That was fine. I was doing an unpaid internship in the Council of Europe, so it was, I needed to start uh, my own I guess, uh, endeavors to make some money and to, to, to live autonomously without having to rely on the state, as a lot of people my age group do, because unfortunately that's just the reality of growing up in the recession. It's very difficult to actually be who you want to be. But that is exactly what blockchain can empower you. And so I suppose when, when you look at, uh, say, cannabis, that has always been around in my life, um, that has never negatively impacted the decision to come public with cannabis at the age of 15 or 16 campaigning for this. That has never negatively impacted my job opportunities because I created my own jobs and I created jobs for people around me. And we all started sustaining ourselves and sustaining our own lives independent of the state. And that, I mean, in America, that's considered to be, I suppose, the, the pinnacle of freedom. It's not necessarily, in my opinion, I think there's a lot more to life than money, but I think that this is exactly our starting point. We came from the place of removing centralization and removing banks, and where that will be applied, I think, is, is, is going to be huge. And we're only just seeing it. This is only the tip of the iceberg. There's very few services or goods that have actually... Uh, Silk Road is probably the most successful one. That was an illegal marketplace where, unfortunately, the owner got imprisoned. But, you know, there's many more services that are being built, and there's many more smart cities, sustainable projects. The World Food Programme, earlier on this year, in 2017, 2018, they facilitated 100,000 transactions from Syrian refugees in Eastern Europe. 100,000 transactions were done on a blockchain with Syrian refugees who had no means of identity or income, no means of that at all. So now we're seeing development aid actually going into something useful. Development aid started as a concept of what if we dropped a load of resources from a helicopter in the sky into some of these countries? And what happens? Survival of the fittest. You get capitalism where no money exists. You get this like unfortunate nature within humans. But if they want to survive, they must survive. But now we're moving into a world where we can actually track and trace where development aid is going. So every time you make a donation, you can see who did it help and how did they help them. And if it didn't help them, then don't donate to that charity ever again. Move on to another one, move on to another one. And that's, that's, that's the point, I think, that we're building. It's all these services and applications out of this um, 2008 invention with Bitcoin. And I'm, I'm very excited about it. We want to do some conversational, so if Hi. you have some questions or comments... I have a, just a question. I thought Bitcoin was notoriously unecological in its farming methods. I mean, sustaining the servers that are necessary for producing Bitcoin is one of the least energy efficient ways of producing capital. So how is that compatible with developing... Yeah, that's, a, that's a fantastic question and it's one we get quite a lot. And so, I mean, if you compare uh, the current financial system and it's uh, the way it it uh, facilitates wealth inequality and the amount of energy that gets consumed because of we wealth inequality. So you have um, small groups of people who are able, empowered to uh, use massive amounts of the Earth's resources. That's one, one factor. So you need to subtract the figure from the current financial system from this to get uh, a baseline figure. Number two, um, 
the country Iceland, which famously burned the bondholders. The reason they were able to burn the bondholders is because they had geothermal energy underneath them. That geothermal energy, if it was in the form of oil, the oil would have been stolen from them. But you cannot steal geothermal energy, but you can use it to mine Bitcoin. And that's where a huge amount of Bitcoin mining takes place in Iceland. So it's a, it's a fantastic use for a natural resource that otherwise would go to waste. Um, in, in China, there is a whole hydroelectric dam that is used for mining uh, Bitcoin. There um, are, you know, waste energy from wind farms because wind farms have to be turned off a lot of the time. So it will always go to the cheapest form of energy because the cheapest form of energy will be the one that will be used for mining. So um, I don't know, is there any more to answer that? Um, but does that... It, it, it does answer, but there's, I mean, yeah. I do have a, an additional just yeah. sort of okay. comment on it. It's just, I mean, in, in development theory, modernization is one of the aspects that brought on this kind of wealth inequality. So I, I'm kind of skeptical as to how further modernization yeah. and further dependency on, okay. on everyone actually possessing um, technological means, which are yeah. all, um, they have in, in, inbuilt obsolescence. So when your smartphone that allows you to access Bitcoin and allows you to access that dies, you're going to have to buy from a corporation another cell phone, which is contributing to that same inequality and the same like sustenance of development problems all around the world. I mean, there's a reason why... why so, I mean, modernization is also part of the, of the problem, so I don't see that it can be the whole solution, really. Sort of um, yeah, and uh, you're, I think I agree with you to some extent. Um, there, are, there are different protocols, um, blockchain protocols, that use a different type of uh, proof. So you have uh, proof of work, which is the Bitcoin protocol. It's proof of work, so it uses electricity to make sure that the thing is rock solid. You know, it uses a lot of energy. Um, but... Uh, it needed to be really strong to be the first one to survive. And then all the other protocols could come in on the back of it. So you have other ones that come in that are uh, proof of stake, which do not burn energy. They're different. And th so all of those are, are going to come through in the fore, you know. But one other um, point I want to mention is uh, you, the, the currency itself, Bitcoin, is limited uh, to 21 million Bitcoins. And that's quite important because and this is to do with the wealth inequality question. So the euro, the dollar, and the other fiat currencies are not limited. And for the last number of years in Europe, for instance, we've been printing 80 billion a month that we know of. So that's one trillion a year, approximately. That's a big percentage of the entire float, right? So um, that's hidden inflation. It's a hidden tax on all of us of 10%. Everything gets more and more expensive because of this dilution of our currency, but they hide it really well. It's called hedonic adjustment is one of the ways they hide it. So you can maybe do some research on that and factor it into your, your topic of um, the environmental factor of, of Bitcoin. So thanks for the question. I, well, I, I think it's maybe important to say uh, the gold mining uh, <laughs> use more energy and contaminate a lot of water and actually the Bitcoin mining use the 10% of the energy to use the f to mining gold and don't uh, pollute water. I guess that is important to... <laughs> to have yeah, so uh, my name is Mohammed Kayoum. Uh, we're just, uh, I come from the same pharmaceutical background, so I understand what you're talking about. And I, I want to go in that direction of what can be done in medical research and uh, clinical trials and yeah. that data and protection of data, what blockchain enables people to, you know, because this is the tool mm -hmm. that is being used by our colleagues in pharmaceutical industry to control a lot of people and lives. So if blockchain, how can blockchain technology, what you were talking about, okay, is well, it happening? Has anyone done it? Um, I, I think we're, we're um, building the foundations of it. So um, the first thing you need to know is you need to understand the quality of the product that's involved in the trial. So, um, you know, what we're starting out doing is um, uh, creating quality documents, notarizing the quality documents, generating um, an immutable document um, that captures every piece of data, you know, pertaining to quality parameters. 
Um, so uh, the patient or the customer can have access to this. Uh, this will be open, you know, so this could be like a QR code on the packaging material. Yeah. So they could scan a QR code. Yeah. They would be taken to a, um, a patient study, uh, specially designed uh, survey um, that they can complete. But um, you know, blockchain will certainly allow us to be able to know that a person is a real person and they're not a bot or not some thing that's trying to pollute the data. You know, so I think there's scope there for that. So um, that's what we're looking at as as being the best potential. Um, so we just um, recently uh, started a um, medicinal mushroom growing facility in an organic land in, in West Cork in Ireland, and it was really nice to do this. So we, we um, inoculated beech logs with turkey tail mushroom, and I'm blown away by turkey tail mushroom and the lion's mane mushroom and all the other ones. Like, you know, they distract me from the cannabis plant because they're so cool as well, you know? And um, so we, we've been notarizing the parameters of this production, and we intend to, you know, um, formulate and extract put a QR code that links you to um, a, a, a large patient study. I don't think we need to get into the, the minute detail to do with safety and what are the mechanisms in the body. It's pointless. I think we need to just find effi of. efficacy and end of. Exactly. Yeah, that's brilliant. I mean. so another question or comment or something? Yeah, I actually have a question as well, sorry. <laughs> um, so, the, the attention to blockchain and Bitcoin is increasing constantly. And um, I'm wondering, how can you bring this to a generation that is not so familiar with technology? How can you really spread it to everyone accessible? Like, what's... The, what steps you, can you take? Because I, I have I, no clue of I this guess, technology. Um, describing yeah. use cases that they will understand. So um, use cases that will answer problems they have. But over the years, I've been trying to perfect my ability to explain uh, this in simple terms that, like, and to get it into a few sentences. And sometimes it works and sometimes I, it doesn't work. But um, it doesn't stop me from uh, um, like trying to better my way of being a better communicator about this topic, you know, so um, use cases and describing them like we are now here, you know, so. I guess it's important to the knowledge management because uh, we have uh, a lot of changes in our world now. The fourth industrial revolution is not only blockchain, it's robotization, artificial intelligence, etc. And we need uh, to make knowledge management to have a real intergenerational collaboration, to have an, a soft change of society uh, without a lot of uh, conflicts, you know. So uh, actually we work in that in the Nomad Institute to uh, bring this information uh, to the to all f our fathers <laughs> and our grandfathers because uh, it's difficult to understand the the future of our societies if you think like analogical, you know. Yeah, and I think what you're asking there is how do we move from a protocol backend technology into a product or service that anybody can use and is very accessible. So. Comparatively, how could we move from um, creating networks and communicating over networks to allowing the first commercial email, which uh, now everyone uses whatever, Google or Gmail, Yahoo, whatever their favorite email client is. There's so many choices, just so many choices. So what we're building is um, a wristband for music festivals where you could have 100,000 people loading this with cryptocurrencies and using it amongst any event. Outside of that event, they could use it within dispensaries. They could use it within bars, pubs, um, cafes, vinyl record stores. And that's what we're building with Festi, and that's how we believe user adoption will be increased, is just by creating something very simple, a nice interface that anybody uh, can use. So yeah, it's, it's coming. That's Hi. already here. Um, I've got a question uh, with regards to blockchain, um, because I've been going to some conferences in the UK, learning about it, the cost um, issue that was mentioned earlier, and the energy use. Um, 
and it seemed attractive to me how it could be used, for example, water footprints or something. But then I have a question with regards to, again, to do with the energy use, um, to do with how much in the commons is blockchain really? Um, because the, the price and everything is determined by a certain group of people um, buying more coins. Um, and then I learned about Holochain, which is a concept which is coming from roots of Mozilla, uh, you know, Firefox, that sort of background. And they're saying that the energy cost is not only a lot less, but it's actually the, the root of this is it's working more around in the... Uh, it's, it's working based on P, more on uh, P2P distribution. So instead of one server, everyone in this room can be hosting, um, hosting a chain. So I just wanted to get your thoughts on that, like how open and how democratically placed is something like blockchain? And then uh, I think you'd mentioned earlier something to do with smart technology, um, smart cities. And my question there is that um, the smart cities, the one I understand is to do with Wi-Fi and smart devices. When they're now showing in the US that where you have smart technology, i.g. smart meters, they're actually um, suffocating the oxygen that is required for the plants. So we're all getting excited in smart technology, but are we actually taking any look at the impact of this new technology on Mother Nature? And all that radiation, is it really good? Um, That's a know. great question. Thank you. So um, part one of that question is, how distributed really is the network of, say, Bitcoin, Ethereum, Holochain? I have no idea what that is, but um, honestly, so I need to look that up. But Bitcoin, uh, there's, I don't know, over 20,000 nodes currently being in operation. Uh, anybody can set up a node. You just plug it on. You can run it on your computer. You can run it on an old mobile phone. Anyone can do this. Ethereum, there's about 17,000 nodes. Um, the difficulty there, I suppose, is that uh, the ways in which Ethereum is run is that it, it, you have to download the entire client or the entire history of transactions. They're integrating something called sharding, which means that you would only have to download the transactions that are relevant to you, so within your use case or industry. And I guess probably what Holochain or any other of the newer protocols coming out, um, which are all still like generation one and generation two, you know, like we're still figuring out that first um, scalability question. Um, they're using a lot of smart ways to try and fix that. The second thing then is an assumption that smart uh, cities have to, by some reason, be like um, the technology, like a supercomputer or some sort of like, um, I don't know, mechanistic like robot. Um, a smart city, like I, we live in a smart city. Uh, we have bicycles. You guys in London have those bikes as well. Dublin have bikes. You know, uh, this city have those like scooters outside. They're great, right? But um, when you implement something like Bitcoin or a cryptocurrency, like they haven't, um, there's this company, I think it's like Ojo or something like that. We met them like about a year ago and they're a bike rental scheme. But instead of having to bring the bikes back to a station, they just have a built-in GPS so that can be located anywhere. And actually, as you cycle, you earn cryptocurrency. So it's a very nice idea that you can actually be promoting certain types of activity within your city, which is smart which is smart, but it's also sustainable. And that's the point. That's the point that we should be looking at, and we should be promoting that more and more. Sorry, we have time only for one question more. <clears throat> Thanks again, guys, for linking the role of Bitcoin in this smart way of thinking. Um, I am pleased to say that the Cannabis Museum in Dunedin, New Zealand, has strong links to both Bitcoin and the culture of cannabis and has been doing so for a couple of years, educating people about that role. So there are pioneers that are picking up on that um, concept and uh, the cannabis industry seems to be fueling some of that connectivity to emerging smart thinking around this. The, the thing that I bring to this and the question I have is that when we think about copyright or the use of something, right, that that copyright often has parameters that we could attach to it that allow user rights to that 
you know, the, the right to print something versus the right to read something, for example, is smart thinking. And that was pioneered by Professor Brad Cox out of uh, GMU in, in, um, in uh, North Virginia uh, some years ago. But the, changing the paradigm about thinking about when we buy something rather than owning it, actually having the expressed use of it and that is embodied in what you're doing is really sustainable because then you can pass it on to someone else and they can get an equal value out of that. You don't actually have to own it. Right? You have got an expressed entitled use of it. And the, the Lime scooters have just recently been adopted in our city, but we're not, our city is not smart enough to be able to make that happen in a constructive way. Lime is effectively riding on top of what that is. I think we just have to get a bit smarter about integrating that into smart city thinking and having that open software availability. So the concept of open software and connectivity to this is what, what I'd uh, ask of you. How open are we really and when this technology is so restricted to a number of us? I'm a founder of the Electronic Commerce Society of Boston, for example. I know that this has been a conversation held over a long period of time, but we actually haven't got close enough yet. So it's a consumable yeah, just um, only from my own experience to, to talk about the open source nature of, of these products and protocols. So the, the two that I'm using, um, the notary and the um, decentralized storage, which the decentralized storage is people renting out their free hard drive space uh, and, sh and allowing encrypted data to be stored on their spare hard drive space. Um, and they get earn a small token for that. But the user uh, who is storing the data decentralized, i.e. not on an Amazon server where it's centralized and they get to see your data or whatever, we don't know. Um, so, uh, you know, that's open source. And I am, you know, kind of mining that. So I'm taking part in that project where I have rented out some hard drive space and, and other um, uh, support that I give to that network. In return, I store my quality data on the system. So, um, uh, and also, um, the the notary is open source. Um, so I am running a, a bunch of nodes uh, around the world on different servers, and I can actually um, I could give you my IP address and the app that I set up to to allow you to to notarize your anything you see fit, or I could show you how to do it yourself if you wished. So. Um, I, I only can talk about the ones that I'm doing myself, but that's their examples, at least, anyway, you know, so. Yeah, I think that's a very good question, very uh, intelligent question. And I guess, like, I would take my inspiration from 2007 when I came across the Pirate Party. And uh, one of the three pillars which, in which they stood upon was the, refer the revolution of intellectual property in relation to digital rights. Uh, this was a big thing for BitTorrent. Kim Kim.com, who was uh, going up against Hollywood, um, and he had to exile to New Zealand and like some massive trouble over, uh, over about just what, exposing um, the idea that someone could share their DVD or their movie clip on the internet with a friend. Um, I fully support the open source nature of projects like what Kim.com, BitTorrent, and that's really where Bitcoin has come from. Is, it is, it's come from BitTorrent and the idea of that peer to peer we can share information and exchange transactions. So where has this taken us today with, say, for example, Ethereum? And I would, I would just regard that as probably the best development-friendly like, tool that's out there, available for anyone to use. Anybody can set up their own token or coin or blockchain with 20 lines of code that is open, soft, that is open source, and it's available on the ethereum.org website. Anyone can do it. Now, I'm not like, computer literate to the point of, um, you know, that I'm able to develop my own apps out of like Python or JavaScript or whatever, although, you know, those are concepts that I can understand. I can understand them only because other people have allowed me to understand them because I've, they've shared it on community forums, on Reddit, and other places where P2P is respected. I guess there is a little bit of work to go and get that. Um, for me, one of the most enjoyable things I've ever done is just 
smoke a joint or vape actually I don't smoke but vape or consume and go online and just research this stuff like get really deep into it and you learn and you just feel like wow that's that you learn something new it's very empowering how do we get that into the hands of everybody I think early intervention much like the drug or drug education should be much like our technological education get into like four-year-olds or five-year-olds I wouldn't say too young to be honest with tech probably not as young as I would with horticulture I would say maybe more like six or seven but get into their mindsets and what would they like to see developed on the internet like they're using it with minecraft at the moment which i understand like kids are just developing cities and ideas on top of this block which for us was lego and now it's like digital lego so that they're the innovators let's give the tools to them let's figure out what they want to do with it i'm you know we're kind of almost done here you know it's like we've we've done a little bit in history we're, yeah. we're happy with it but our children they're the ones who are going to do more so um yeah i, I just want to add one you did uh, Graham just reminded me of this because we're very active in the blockchain space and and also quite active in the medical cannabis space, space and you know all of plant medicine the spirit of the two yeah right so the, really yeah is that true yeah okay I didn't know that okay all oh, right there you go so but I'd like to you know just allude to the the point that the spirit of the two different groups are very similar um, the feeling you get from working in both the, and the buzz and the energy is is quite similar, you know, and I, I think they're meant to work together and I think there's so much they can offer each other and um, to help each other out. So. So thank you very much. I, I'm so glad to <laughs> have your contribution, really, because it's the first time to in this kind of conference, uh, I guess, talk really about the the this issue and I guess it's important and actually I want to close with uh, some uh, 500 years ago we start to fight against one Pope of the Medici they found the banks so and Luther work against that and we start the separation between uh, our faith and states so 500 years later, we start the fight against the banks to separate our money from the state. Thank you.